Okay, so, um, the end of classical civilization is the Romans, um, which would be Unit 2, Section 4 in this particular slideshow. So the Roman era starts about 800 BC, ends about 500 AD, or BCE and CE as we now call them. Originally, Rome is just the little orange area in that map you see there, small, tiny little area, eventually blossoms out to include all of Italy, uh, Greece, and Turkey. Um, and eventually, of course, later, as it becomes an empire, Rome basically gets most of, certainly all of Western Europe, all of North Africa, all of the Middle East, or the ancient Middle East, I should say, um, and the pink area, basically, you see in the map, right? Um, interesting, if you look at the map and you look at the white areas, you notice that Ireland, up in the top left, um, called Hibernia back then, was undiscovered by the Romans. Um, they didn't believe it existed. They thought it was a mythological place. Um, and so it's not that they didn't conquer it because they couldn't. It's they didn't know it was there, um, or they didn't believe it was there, let's say. Um, and then by the time they found out it was legit, uh, problems elsewhere in the empire, and they never bothered to go. Um, obviously, you see um, the German tribes uh, as another big separate distinction. It's kind of, if you look at the weird shape of the borders there, it's basically because they follow rivers for the most part, um, with the exception of Dacia, which today is modern-day Romania, and that's under the Emperor Trajan. He conquered that area over the river. But prior to that, it just had followed the river. And then other areas are either mountains that got in the way, deserts that got in the way, especially in the Africa and Arabia region, or as you see in the far right in the green, another empire that got in the way. Occasionally the Romans did conquer the Parthians, but you couldn't really add it, say it was added to the empire. So the Roman period, just like all the other periods, has a bunch of really important historical events. Um, the date is red, as you can see, because that is an important date you need to remember for a test. The founding of Rome, not because of that reason, but because of the reason that the Romans measured time from that date. So if you asked an ancient Roman, and even still today, some Roman, what year it is rather than 2023, or whatever year it happens to be now, um, <clears throat> they would say, you know, 2,756 years since the founding of Rome, right? Or of an event that happened before it happened 200 years before the founding of Rome. That would be their date. Um, Rome is actually divided into four periods. Two of them are on the slide. The monarchy period when they had kings. The republican period when they were democracy. The empire when they had emperors. is actually divided into two parts. Early empire, late empire. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's basically late empire. The Roman empire is kind of starting to fall apart, etc. Uh, Rome fights against its first big rival, the Carthaginians, a North African tribe in modern-day Tunisia um, that actually were a colony of the Phoenicians, the people who created the alphabet and spread the alphabet, I should say. They didn't really create it. Um, hence, Punic comes from the word Phoenician. Um, <clears throat> and the Romans fight several wars against them, three big wars, in ancient World War I, World War II, World War Three, if you want. Um, because so many different places are involved in those wars, not just the Romans and Carthaginians, but all their allies uh, all over Western Europe and North Africa. These the different battles were fought. Um, the Romans win each war, not easily, none of them easily. Um, <clears throat> Italy even gets invaded during the Second Punic War, the famous Hannibal crossing the Alps with the elephants. Um, but eventually the Rome wins all, th all three wars, the first two are legit um, power struggles. The third war is more of the Roman rich people wanted the territory where the Carthaginians were, so they kept making lies and stories up and exaggerating the danger of the Carthaginians, you know, attacking them again. And the third war was basically the Romans invading, again, modern-day Tunisia, making it into a Roman province and destroying the city of Carthage forever, like completely destroyed the city. So then the second batch of important things happened is this three Punic Wars. There's also three civil wars um, in the Roman world, and those are all purely political. Um, Rome made its fatal mistake in its Republican period of doing what we do, 
which is having only two political parties. And having only two political parties actually caused these civil wars to happen. Um, what's going on? So after we have the three Punic Wars, what kind of world wars against the foreign enemy much later um, during the Roman Republican period when it was a democracy. We talked a little bit about that in class. Um, if not, we we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, Rome starts off as a monarchy uh, about 250 years or so have having different kings. They really hate it. They don't like this idea of one guy in charge. They rebel eventually, kill the last king and form the, the world's first Republican representative democracy, basically the same kind of democracy that America has, um, up to and including the names of the people who made the laws were called senators, right? Uh, there were two houses, the Senate House, and then the other house was called the Tribune House, the tribunals, uh, kind of like the House of Representatives. It's more common folk would, would be part of the tribunal and the Speaker of the House, in this case, the Tribune of the Plebs, um, also had the power to um, veto. The Romans didn't have one president. They had two consuls who both had equal power and both could veto laws, um, which obviously led for problems a lot of the time, because if the two guys didn't like each other, you basically had a year of nothing happening. They would just veto each other's bills and veto the bills of the party that they didn't like. So like I said, Rome made the huge mistake of when they formed a democracy to, in that democracy, only have two political parties. Originally, those parties um, were called, like, uh, the optimates, the best, right, and then the not-so-best. But eventually, they became better known as the patricians and the plebeians. Patrician, patrician sorry, would be like the rich, wealthy landowners. Um, with families of, with years of being in Rome and historically nobility, that kind of stuff. And the plebeians being kind of ordinary folk, workers, et cetera, and so on. Um, probably with less, no, definitely with less famous family names and stuff like that. And <clears throat> so what, what happens is one party kind of represents the rich, the other kind of party represents the poor. Again, very similar to American democracy. And we have Two political parties, one that kind of favors the wealthy, one that kind of favors the poor, um, in a very similar to American system. It's very, very similar, sometimes scary how similar it is, because what most people forget when they study the Roman Empire is how this duel, once they switched down to only two political parties and they all both became special interest parties um, and not really concerned with the people, per se, um, it collapsed and we ended up, Rome ended up with a dictatorship. So you have the same kind of scenario, if you want, in modern America. You have this two party system. The two parties don't like each other. The two parties don't work together. And you have split government all the time. One party runs the presidency, the other party runs the Senate or the House, right? And you basically get nothing done. It was basically the past 30 years of American democracy, right? Um, so the Romans end up with that same kind of problem, with two sides not getting along, two sides fighting and vetoing each other all the time, constantly. And what ends up happening is, like I said, um, two big civil wars. There are three, but two that are related directly to the political party system. The first one, of course, um, here is... Um, Marius, who's with the plebeian party, the common people party, although he's from a very wealthy family and a very rich family. Um, and then Sulla from the patricians, from the rich people, from the wealthy, also from a very important family. Um, both wanting, you know, to have supreme power in a sense, both becoming very important generals, both winning very many important military victories um, against Rome's enemies. Um, unfortunately, both also being consul at one point, you couldn't rerun for consul once you became consul, unless it was 10 years later. So, uh, But there were, uh, there was a strange loophole in Roman democracy that does not exist in American democracy, which is very different. And that is because they had two people that had equal power, there could be an emergency. And in a time of an emergency, you didn't want them fighting each other. 
over who should be in power and over who should make the decision. So they actually held a special election for a dictator. The, the word dictator comes from the Latin word, the, the guy who gives orders that you can't question, right? It doesn't mean, may, didn't mean back then what it meant today. Number one, it was an elected position. They voted for it. Number two, it was a time limit, six months. You had to be dictator. That's it. If you didn't fix the emergency at six months, they elected another person. It couldn't be you again for six months to try to fix it. So during the Punic Wars, there were several dictators trying to save the Romans from the Carthaginian successes and battles, etc. So we do have that happening. Um, so like I said, we have these two generals, ex-consuls, um, who could be chosen for a dictatorship because the only way, that's, I forgot this part, one part of being a dictator, you had to have been a consul before, right? So you had to have been that. So you had to have that experience under you, right? That you've already run the country for a year or helped run the country for a year. Um, and so there's a, a problem with King Mithridates over in Turkey. It's not called Turkey back then, but I'm just making our lives easier. Um, and the plebeians want Marius to be the general who leads the battle. And the patricians want Sulla to be the general who leads the battle. And Somewhere there's a miscommunication, whether on purpose, intentionally or not, and they both end up raising soldiers and going to go do the battle. Unfortunately, they both find out that the other has been chosen, don't like it, and rather than going fighting King Mithridates, they fight one another. Um, so the First Roman Civil War breaks out. Um, Sulla is victorious. Um, he is given a brand new title that never happened before. So you could say this is like the beginning of the end of democracy in Rome, this event. And that is that Sulla is given the title dictatorship until you fix the problem instead of dictatorship for six months, right? And so dictatorship until you fix the problem, which takes him about three and a half years. And believe it or not, probably for the first time in history, and certainly one of the rare few times in history, when he feels that he has finished fixing the problem, which is cleaning up the plebeian rebellion, basically, um, he retires. He retires to his villa out in the countryside and is basically dies of old age and never heard from again. Um, again, rarely that someone who has complete power like that gives it up voluntarily, and you're going to see very few examples of it. Um, of course, everyone's heard of the Spartacus slave revolt. That happens. It's crushed by a, a very rich Roman named Crassus, who's, you know, kind of like... Um, the Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk of his day in terms of wealth. Actually, he would make them look poor, to be honest. Um, that's how much money he had. Um, so he gets himself a generalship. He stops the slave revolt um, and gets himself some fame in Rome as well. It's important, and the reason I bring that up is because then um, Julius Caesar, who's a member of that plebeian, uh, backs up the plebeians, um, Pompey, who backs up the patricians, and then Crassus, who's also a patrician, all get together one day and decide, basically, we're going to rule Rome illegally and make all the decisions about who's going to win elections, who's going to get elected, who's going to get what governorships, who's going to be able to, you know, lead what armies, because they have three separate paces of power. So Pompey is a super famous general. Um, defeated the Spanish Rebellion, conquered the pirates um, off the coast of Italy, defeated um, a rebellion in Africa, um, defeated Mithridates, the guy that was given the trouble earlier, um, and was a well-known general who the troops loved. So he had kind of the army backing him, and he was a shoe in to be a guy in power and to influence his power as much as possible. Of course, he does eventually become consul. They all become consul. Crassus, like I told you, the richest guy in the world, so he can bribe enough people to get you know himself into power and his friends into power. And then Caesar actually is kind of poor, believe it or not, although he comes from a very, very, very prestigious family, um, one of the earliest ancient families of Rome, the Julii family. Julius isn't really his name, by the way. His first name was Gaius. Um, Julius is the family name, and Caesar is actually a nickname. Um, in Latin, it kind of means hairy, and it was a facetious nickname because Caesar 
was going bald very early in his life. So they called him the hairy guy as a joke because he was going bald. So later Caesar obviously becomes a title, which is pretty funny. It just means hairy. Um, and so they sit together and decide we're going to run stuff rather than fight each other. Because basically they're always fighting each other at first. And no one ever really gets enough votes to get, be in complete control. And so they figured instead of fighting each other, why don't we get together and we will be in complete control. So they do. They sit down. They call call create what's called the first triumvirate completely illegally, by the way outside of the law, but basically behind the scenes, they're running everything. So why is Caesar in this? Why do they care? Well, one, his family name and his prestige, but more importantly, his ability, his speaking ability is so well known and so good that they know he can convince a crowd basically to do anything. And he has all of the poor people in Rome basically under his wing. Um, and so he's got the numbers. Pompey's got the soldiers that can intimidate, and Crassus got the money. So numbers, soldiers, money equals we can do whatever the hell we want, right? And they did for the next 50, 11 years or so, including even Pompey ma marrying Caesar's daughter so to solidify the relationship. So they basically divide up the Roman world. You take care of this, you take care of that, and I'll take care of this, and um, Julius Caesar, the only thing he has not accomplished in his life, he's starting to get money, finally. He's got popularity, but he's never been um, uh, given control of a province, so he could get some military victories. And So part of the deal was they give him the province of Gaul, which today is France, but back part of France. Back then, it's basically the Provence area of France, for those of you who don't know geography, probably everybody. It's the southern part of France and the northern part of Italy. Um, he's given that as his governorship. By the end of his governorship, um, eight years later, um, he's conquered all of France, parts of Spain, all and parts of Germany even, um, and then comes back home a big, victorious hero. He conquered all this land for Rome, sent home millions of dollars. All the money he's making, he's giving back to the people in the city of Rome. He's getting even more popular. And that basically is what causes the Second Civil War. Um, Caesar's popularity and his no longer need for Pompey's military causes them to get into a couple of fights, basically. But Crassus always kind of saves them and says, look, 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 we're doing fine. Stop. Don't ruin this. Unfortunately, Crassus also wants, sees Caesar's, excuse me, popularity grow and also wants a big governorship with a military legions to fight. And he goes off to what we, today we, what today is called Turkey, but Asia Minor, where he's going to fight against the Parthian Empire. You saw on the map the Green Empire. Um, un unfortunately, Crassus does really poorly, um, and so poorly that he gets captured and killed. Um, so there's no once Crassus dies, there's nothing really holding Pompey and Caesar together except for Caesar's daughter, who's Pompey's wife, whom Pompey loves, but unfortunately. During childbirth, she dies, so completely severs anything that was holding them together anymore. And again, we split between the power of the patricians and the plebeians again. This time, the plebeians win because Caesar wins. Um, and he gets a brand new title that completely changes, and you could say is the end of the Republic. Um, he's given the title dictator for life. You're a dictator until you die. He's offered the title of king, um, but he turns it down. And in public, anyway. <laughs> but he takes dictator for life, which is basically king, right? So, um, unfortunately for him, <laughs> um, that's not very long. It's two years before uh, the assassination attempt, a plot, um, is successful against him and he is assassinated. And again, the date is there. It's an important date. Um, assassinated by 23 senators who all take a turn stabbing him including the two most famous, um, Brutus and Cassius. If you've ever read Shakespeare, there's a whole thing. Brutus is most likely Caesar's illegitimate son. So that's why when he's dying, his famous last words are, um, I can't believe you did this too, my son. I know in Shakespeare it's et tu brute, but that's not, that's not really what was said if you look at the documents. Um, which is just, and you too, Brutus. But same thing, I can't believe my son, you know, and you too, Brutus. Um, what else? Okay. So then, at the death of Caesar, everyone thought they would be 
treated as heroes that killed Caesar because they killed a tyrant. They killed someone who was trying to become king. And the Romans historically hated kings because of what happened the last time they had one. And they thought that people would have raised up and celebrated that they did this. Um, and when he kills him, uh, the first stab, I think somebody says, this is what happens to tyrants. Semper, semper sic tyrannis. Right? Always this will happen to tyrants. Which is the same thing that John Wilkes Booth said when he shot Abraham Lincoln, just in case you're wondering. Um, and so, unfortunately for them, Mark Antony, Caesar's general, uh, read Caesar's will out loud. He begged the murderers of Caesar to at least let him give him a, a decent burial in a speech. And they said, as long as you don't stir up problems, and he promised he wouldn't stir up problems. Um, and so he read Caesar's will out loud at the ceremony of Caesar's death. So Caesar's up on the pyre. Um, people are saying goodbye, you know. And again, he had a huge following because the people loved him. Um, unfortunately, again, for the bad guys, in C uh, what we consider to be the bad guys now, right? Even though he they, they did kill the tyrant, right? They did kill a dictator. One would think they'd be seen as good guys. Um, is in the will it says Julius Caesar didn't leave his titles to anyone. So this idea that he was trying to be king is kind of dismissed by his will because he didn't give that title of prince or king to any of his kids um, or any of his adopted kids as well. So nobody got that title. Um, they got his house and those kind of things, right? But what he did with his other land that wasn't his home, he actually gave it to the city of Rome as public land to be used for parks. And so this really pissed the people off. And then with some of his money, and you can imagine how much money he must have had, he gave every citizen of Rome that lived in Rome 50 bucks. So here they are reading this will, telling you that... The, right after these people got up there and told them they had to kill him because he was a king dictator and he was going to try to be king and he was trying to take all the power. And then they read his will and it's like, he gave people money to the people, he gave his land to the people, he didn't give any title to his kids except for his house, which you know would be a normal thing that a parent would give to their children. And the people were on fire, they got angry, uh, took Caesar's body, burned it you know, at a temple where they weren't supposed to, and then that started to... Uh, assemble it to get ready to attack the people who murdered Caesar. All 23 senators were put on a list. Um, and of course, most of them got away because they had enough money. So the second triumvirate is actually legally formed. It's voted for on the Senate that Octavian Caesar, Caesar's adopted son, his oldest son, um, Mark Anthony and Lepidus, two of Caesar's generals, are given power of Italy and the Roman world um, to capture and arrest the people who murdered Caesar, all 23. Now, all 23 went in different places um, and raised armies in those different places. And eventually, uh, during this um, period, um, they are eventually all rounded up, all captured, and either killed or killed themselves before they can get captured. Brutus and Cassius, in particular, kill themselves um, before they're captured. All their property, of course, is confiscated and split amongst these three people. Again, I don't think the people, the power the Senate gave them was to keep their property, but that's what happened. And rather than give this power up after they captured everybody, they didn't. And the three of them basically ruled Rome um, and the whole Roman world. And then split it up because they didn't want to all be in the same place. So Octavian controlled Italy and Spain. Mark Anthony controlled Greece the Middle East, and Egypt, and Lepidus was just given Sicily and the islands. Um, why did he take the small lands? Because um, they don't sound as unimportant. Um, they weren't as unimportant sounding as they were important, because Sicily and the islands off the coast of Italy were the ones where all the food came from, all the grain. So he was going to make a millions of dollars just selling grain to the rest of the Roman world. So he was happy with that. Um, unfortunately, just like any other kind of time, this third civil war is not really a political one. Anthony, Mark Antony and Octavian and Lepidus are all in the same political party, the same political party as Caesar. But when Lepidus dies of old age in Sicily, Mark Antony and Octavian basically are one guy against another guy. And that's never good when two guys are in power and both want all the power. So they kind of plot and scheme. And again, sometimes they get along... Mark Antony actually marries Octavian's daughter, Octavius. 
But then he publicly divorces her and marries Cleopatra, which is like a slap in the face. He married a foreign woman from another country rather than a Roman woman. And the Romans were really pissed off about it pretty much. Um, and it starts another civil war. Basically, this civil war was um, Octavian used Mark Antony's trick. He actually stole Mark Antony's will out of the Temple of Saturn, not Temple of Saturn, Temple of Vesta, um, and read it in public. Uh, because he had heard, and whether this is true or not, if it really was in the will or not, we'll never know, but he read it out loud like it really was, and that was enough. And in the will it said he was going to give all his lands to him and Cleopatra's kids. And that just made everybody hate Mark Antony, um, because you know, how dare he give his lands to people who weren't Roman. These were Roman lands, right? Um, and that basically turned everybody against Mark Antony, who then joins with Cleopatra right, and fights against Octavian. But Octavian obviously um, wins, becomes the sole ruler of the Roman world. Egypt becomes part of Rome. It's no longer its own independent country, and it will never be an independent country again until the 1900s. So quite a long time, 2,000 years of it not being independent. Um, and then Octavian basically runs the country without any official title. So the Senate is still passing laws, but only laws that Octavian wants until about the fourth year of his rule when he decides to change his name from Octavian to Augustus, which means worship me, basically. Um, and that moment officially ends the Roman Republic. Rome officially becomes an empire because Augustus is given the title Imperator, which is where we get the word emperor from, um, and is given the title first princeps, first prince, first citizen of Rome, and becomes its first emperor. Not Julius Caesar, like you may have been taught, but Octavian Caesar or Augustus Caesar. So that starts the imperial period, which lasts for about 500 more years, right? From about 27 BC to 476. Again, within that imperial period, there's really two other periods, the early imperial period and the late imperial period which is basically just distinguished between a decline and everything, basically, somewhere around the 200s or so. Um, late 200s, early 300s, we're in the late, we start to get into the late imperial period where things start to you know, fall apart. So obviously if we have an imperial period and we have an empire and we have, we're going to have a dynasties, right? The first of those dynasties is the Julio-Claudian dynasty, right? And that's ruled by people related to the Julian family and the Claudian family. Julius Caesar comes from the Julian family. So that is Augustus himself. Then Augustus' son, well, technically son, his adopted son. The same thing, Augustus isn't really Caesar's son. He's adopted, but legally that makes you a son, right? So Tiberius. And then Caligula, who is a nephew of Augustus. And then Claudius, who is a nephew of Augustus. Um, no, sorry, grandson of Augustus. And then Nero, who's Claudius' adopted son, is the last of the Julio-Claudians. Again, you've probably heard a million stories about these different emperors. Um, the more famous, or should I say infamous ones, are, are Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero. Tiberius didn't really want to be emperor. He's kind of like a Paris Hilton of his day. <laughs> he just wanted to party and show off and not be bothered with day-to-day -day affairs. So he actually put his friend in charge. <laughs> And his friend was horrible, terrible, terrible person, a terrible ruler, and had everybody killed that disagreed with him until Tiberius basically had to come back because his family went to him. He's like, he's going to kill us too, you idiot. And so he had to kill his friend who had threatened to kill his, you know, his kids, his mom, his sisters, whatever. And so he was very unhappy that he had to be emperor. So some people think he chose Caligula to be the next emperor on purpose, so people would forget what a terrible emperor he was, because <laughs> he knew Caligula was an, a lunatic, even at a young age. And Caligula is a lunatic, and Caligula is the one you've probably heard a million stories about. He made his horse consul and told the Senate they couldn't pass any laws unless the horse said yes. Of course, that never happened. Um, he had all of the Vestal Virgins raped and then buried alive because the punishment for having sex if you're a Vestal Virgin was to bury you alive so that he could put his family members in those positions. Um, he invented, I guess, cuckolding. He would invite rich senators to his house and then have sex with their wives in front of him, um, in front of them to embarrass them. Um, 
he wanted to get the title Imperator, and the only way you could get the title Imperator is if you won a military battle, and he didn't want to do that, so he declared war on the ocean and fought a war against the ocean, and won as low tide went out. The ocean retreated, so he won, so he could get the title Imperator. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. Um, and a lot of other crazy things. He invented the orgy. Um, I don't know. Fortunately, when he was murdered by his own guard because he was doing the same thing to his guards when they pissed him off that he was doing to the senators, which is having sex with their wives in front of him, they failed to defend him during one of the assassination attempts on purpose, and so he was assassinated. And then the guard actually chose the guards, the Praetorian guards, which are the emperor's private bodyguards, chose Claudius to be the next emperor. Not because they thought he would be a good emperor, but they thought he would be easily manipulated. Because poor Claudius was born with a speech impediment and a club foot. So he limped and spoke funny. So they assumed because he limped and spoke funny, he must be dumb. Unfortunately for them, because he limped and spoke funny, he read a lot and was ridiculously smart. Um, and the first thing he did when he became emperor is kill all the bodyguards so they wouldn't run stuff and put people he trusted in those positions. And actually, all the money and extravagance and ridiculousness that Caligula did, Claudius fixed and actually conquered some land, including England, is conquered under Claudius the emperor. And Claudius is only problem. He's actually a good emperor. Um, there's a great movie or series called I, Claudius that kind of tells the story of everything I just did from Augustus through Claudius um, that you should watch. I don't know you will, but you should. Um, it's based on a book, and the book is good too, but again, I don't see anybody reading. Claudius's only mistake was he was really bad at wives. His first wife loved Caligula's idea of the orgy so much that she used to have them when her husband wasn't around, and obviously that was embarrassing, and he had to divorce her. And his second wife was the mother of Nero, who wanted her son to be the next emperor and killed basically everybody to make sure that Nero would be the next emperor, um, including Claudius eventually. And she didn't kill him right away because he didn't pick Nero. He picked other people to be the next emperor. And everybody he picked mysteriously died, got poisoned, was mysteriously attacked by wolves, etc. and so on. Um, so he eventually picks Nero as he's getting older and there's nobody left. And that same magical week that he picks Nero to be emperor when he dies, he dies, you know, of a stomach virus. Probably she poisoned him. Um, and so Nero becomes emperor. He's too young, about 14, 15 years old when he becomes emperor. And at first, believe it or not, the first few, I mean, no one ever talks about this, the first few years of Nero's emperorship, he's actually a pretty decent emperor. It's later in his life, um, five or six years in, when his mom basically is, his mom is basically killing everybody off that influences Nero because she wants to really be the one in charge running the things. Um, so anyone that's influencing Nero, again, mysteriously, magically kind of dies off. Nero eventually figures out that his mom's killing everybody <laughs> and has her arrested and given the death penalty, but nobody will do the death penalty because what if the emperor changes his mind later? So no one will kill her. So Nero actually kills her himself with his own hands. He strangles her. Um, and from that moment on, he becomes a crazy emperor. Probably dealing with killing your own mother had something to do with it. Um, there are also some evidence that Nero and Caligula, since they were little and raised in the palaces, um, had lead poisoning. And lead poisoning affected their brains, and that's why they were so crazy. Um, Nero... Um, didn't want to be emperor either, by the way. He wanted to be an artist. He wanted to sing, uh, do poetry, um, which to the Romans was like the lowest class thing you could do. Like you, if your daughter told you she came home and said, I want to be an actress, you'd tell her, can't you be a prostitute instead? That's so much better. So you can have an idea how low the actors were looked at in those days. Again, today we worship actors and musicians. Anciently, actors and musicians were basically slaves. An emperor to be wanting to be one was like seen as almost offensive. So Nero actually would sing and play a harp, not really a harp, a lyre, um, wherever he went and expected everyone to cheer for him, of course. And if you didn't cheer for him, he would have you killed. So obviously he always got standing ovations. Uh, he considered himself a big athlete too. So when the Olympics happened while he was 
emperor. He went to the Olympics and participated in all the events and won every single event, which is amazing. He won every single event in the Olympics, um, including the chariot race. Even though the chariot wheel fell off, he still won somehow. Uh, you all can figure that out. Um, but like as he gets crazier, um, like he starts to kill people if they're yawning in the audience while he's there. Um, I'm trying to think of like things that like got him in trouble. But basically, they saw him as this low class dirtbag that happened to be emperor, and it really insulted the nobility. And he did his best to continue to insult them later. Um, the famous things about Nero is the city of Rome caught fire when Nero was emperor, but he wasn't there. So despite all those TV shows and movies that Nero played the fiddle, um, that's just not true. Number one, there's no such thing as a fiddle. And number two, he wasn't even in Rome when the fire started. Um, he was in Capua, which is about today, two hours away in a car. So obviously back then, um, on a horse, um, which he probably didn't ride a horse. He was probably in one of those carriages carried by slaves. So you're taking, probably taking, talking three or four day travel time, um, to get there in that kind of slow moving situation. Uh, however, when he does hear that the fire has started in Rome and it's burning continuously, he stops his vacation, um, gathers as many people as he can to follow him on the way back. Because to put out a fire in those days is basically everyone grabs a bucket and throws water. So he brought as many people as he could back with him to Rome to put out the fire. He does put out the fire. And one would assume he would then be treated as a hero. He put out the fire. Two thirds of the city was destroyed. Two thirds. Um, the reason we give Nero crap for fiddling while Rome burned and he gets blamed for lighting the fire, even though he wasn't in the city, is because unfortunately, the first thing that Nero does after the fire is out and the buildings are, you know, flattened to the ground, he sees all this space has been created by the empty buildings that burn down. And instead of rebuilding people's homes, he builds himself a palace. Um, part of which is still there. You can visit it. It's near the Colosseum. To give you an idea of how big the palace is, um, the Colosseum that you know now used to be the swimming pool, not the big 20-story building. I mean, the same shape, the same size. The reason the Colosseum is the shape it is is because that was the shape of the swimming pool, right? It didn't go up two stories or three stories. It was just a flat swimming pool dug in the earth. But so you can get an idea how big the palace was. That was the swimming pool. And then he painted the whole front of the palace in gold so that when the sun came up, it would reflect off the palace and shine. And then in front of the palace, he built a 45-foot statue of himself um, dressed as the sun god. Um, it's actually where we get the word Colosseum from because the statue was the only thing left um, after they tore down most of the palace um, and built the Colosseum. So the area where the Colossus statue was became known as the Colosseum, area of the Colossus. So, and then the building became known as the Colosseum, but it's really not the name of the building. But it's a different issue completely. So um, so they people start murmuring the reason, oh, that's why he, he set the fire. That's why, he, so that he could build himself a palace. And he had something to do with it. Even though he wasn't here, he had something to do with it. And the second mistake that Nero makes is... Um, People used to, believe it or not, the Iliad and the Odyssey um, were performed as poems that you sang originally. They're not what you get today, which is a book. Um, and in one of the famous scenes in the, in the Iliad is the city of Troy as it burns. And if you re read it, it describes the burning of the city of Troy and how beautiful the flames were, etc. and so on. So Nero took the opportunity to write a poem slash song about how beautiful it was to see the flames of Rome when he came into the city. And so people like, he, he had something to do with this. He had something to do with this. Um, so when that started to happen, he started to get really unpopular. So he basically needed to look for somewhere and someone else to blame for the fire. And unfortunately for Christians, um, two Christian slaves were, were worked for Pompey's wife, Popea. And they tried to convert her to become a Christian. And they told her, they were focused on Jesus coming back, right? And the end of the world. And those who are familiar with the book of Revelations or the apocalypse, 
the last book of the Bible. It says the world will end in fire. So they told her all about this, and she saw it as an opportunity to save her husband um, and told him, look, these Christians, they want the world to end, and they say the world's going to end in fire. Why don't we blame them for starting the fire of Rome and produce this book to prove that that's what they believe? And so that's what he did, and it worked. Everyone blamed the Christians. Everyone believed it was the Christians. And the very first persecution of Christians starts to happen um, because they're blamed for the fire of Rome. The two famous saints, Peter and Paul, are killed during this great persecution. Nero must kill eight, 10,000 Christians easy, easily in the first week. Um, by the way, not in the Colosseum, so despite what you've heard on TV, throwing to the lions and all that other stuff, it did happen. It did not happen at the Colosseum. It's not even built yet. It's just a swimming pool now. right? They are killed, murdered, thrown to lions at the Circus Maximus, which I will show you as we go through the slides. So Nero eventually still irritates enough people that he does get killed um, as well by his own servant, who is, doesn't murder him. His own servant helps him kill himself because he's surrounded and he's by his enemies, They're, the Senate has ordered him, named him enemy of the people, so anybody can arrest him and kill him. And rather than get arrested by the mob or killed by the mob, Nero has his servant help him kill himself. And in one of the great funny, all-time funny last words, um, Nero takes the sword, jumps on it, and says, what a great artist dies today. And that's how he dies. Um, unfortunately, Nero dies, again, without anybody being in charge. And what you happen have in, in the year 68 is the year of the four emperors, because four different guys say they're emperor. Their troops say that they said they should be emperor. Eventually, one wins. That's Vespasian. It starts the second Roman imperial dynasty, the Flavian dynasty, which is just three people, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian, who are most famous for um, the building of the Colosseum. So they tore down Nero's house. They said, we're not going to be like him. And as a matter of fact, we're going to make this public building that everybody can go to for free for sporting events, for gladiator fights, for animal fights. And the Colosseum is built under these guys. Um, Domitian also starts to persecute the Christians as well. Um, and that's for a different reason. Not because they started the fire, but because they won't serve in the military. Because, again, if you remember your commandments, thou shalt not kill is one of the commandments. So... Um, and thou shalt not have any other gods before me, so they won't worship the emperor, and they won't serve in the army. So Domitian starts killing them, because then, then what use are you? You won't worship me, and I can't use you as soldiers, so we might as well kill you off before there's too many of you. In both instances, by the way, the persecution of Nero and the persecution of Domitian, rather than there being less Christians at the end, there end up being more. More people convert. And the reason for that is the way the Christians died. If you read the different death stories of these Christians. None of them went to death afraid. All of them were happy to die. Um, all of them felt they were going somewhere better. And that actually inspired other people. As a matter of fact, at the Circus Maximus, on the outside of the circus, Nero crucified about three or four hundred Christians and lit them on fire so that they could light up the show for nighttime. And instead of screaming and yelling, supposedly the story goes, they were all singing as they were burning, singing to heaven. Uh, and that inspired more people to join, again, rather than quit. Okay, so this is going to end part one, because these are pretty long. The Romans are pretty long. and end part one here, um, and I'll you can go on to part two if you want now or later.